Are you there to do the introduction or this is your your speaker? He might not be. I'm guessing he's not. Right. OK, well, I'll do it then. Um, Tim, uh, back yeah. again. Is, it, is this is this number four? I think this might be number three. three I think I think it's three. The, I think it's the fourth I've attended and, and, and the third I've done. Oh, and I right. hope it isn't the last. No, I'm sure it won't be. I'm sure it won't be. Um, uh, just before you start, we will be back again uh, 16th of April um, and uh, we're just organising the speaker. But Tim, uh, thanks very much for coming back. Uh, My pleasure. The last one you did was around, uh, was it the, the dark art of estimation? Estimation, yeah. Somewhat related just, to this one. And now effective project reporting. So, mm. yeah, thank you for putting this together and uh, I'll hand it the floor to you. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, I think there might be a couple of people on the call who um, don't know me. Um, my name is Tim Bishop. Um, I, as we were just talking about, I've been in IT for a million years. Um, and the easiest way to characterize me is that I'm a um, software engineer and an agile coach. And I specialize in both technology and in um, leading small teams um, of IT people to deliver value. So we've got about 20-ish slides. Not all of them are going to take very long. There's a couple of key concepts here. I make no apologies for the fact that a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight comes directly from the world of software. And, and one of the things I would invite you all to think about, if I may, is how this relates to the world of either your, your 365 stuff or your, your low-code or no-code stuff that you're doing, or even to projects that are, that are not software-related, because personally, I'm really, really interested in that. Um, please, please jump in with any questions. Don't wait until the end. We will have a time for questions at the end. Um, don't worry about um, um, interrupting me. Um, I think, given the display I have, I'm not going to see hands going up, so please just shout out. Um, and the usual rule is that um, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Let's crack on. So what are we going to cover? <clears throat> the challenge that we're trying to solve here is to, is to track progress. I'm cutting straight to the uh, the answer here. There, there's two ways to do it. One is break your work down properly. The other one is, is to do your reporting properly. Um, then we're going to talk about what happens actually in the real world. And then I have a little bit of a conversation um, about a paradox here. Is that going to work? Yes, it is. Um, I've been playing with these tools again. This is not a brilliant picture. You've probably heard the thing about uh, eating the elephant one bite at a time. This doesn't, I said, please make me a picture of a man eating an elephant. Um, but this actually just looks like a man who's really angry at a, an elephant spitting Rice Krispies at him. Um, so the problem is this, broadly speaking, if you have um, a huge great lump of work and somebody says, how long are we going to take to do and how long are we, how are we going to know if we're on track? You really, really can't do that. So I actually had quite an interesting case of this the other night. I was building a sofa for my daughter, uh, and it was one of these big aircraft carrier type sofas from IKEA. And it occurred to me while I was building it that it was quite a good uh, example of, of estimation. Because if you'd said to me at the start, right, here's the sofa. How long is it going to take to put together? I would have said, I don't know, um, hour and a half plus or minus two hours. Uh, and I thought, well, I, as I started to get it all out of the boxes, I thought there's no way I can estimate this at all. And then while I was putting it together, I realized that a, a lot of the little tasks in there were really straightforward. So there must have been about, I don't know, 30 bolts that I had to, to, to tighten and probably about 20 little screws that I had to put in and tighten up. And if you'd said to me, right, how long is that bolt going to take to tighten? I would have said, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds or something. So breaking it down would have allowed me to, to come up with a, with, with a better estimate. Um, this also relates to this picture, which I unashamedly stole from my previous presentation. Would anybody like to tell me what the what the title of this picture is? Anybody? Tell me what you see. What are you seeing? Anybody? If you're typing, I can't see it, by the way. So we've got a group of software engineers because you've got bloody bugs. code in the right hand corner. You've got some bugs as well. That, that it signifies the software engineering. Uh, what's iron the expression I see that? iron filings. Uh, yeah, I don't understand the sort of strange Catholic style <laughs> halos around their heads. That wasn't intentional. Um, right. What's the what's the biggest object you see there? Cone. It's the, it's the cone of uncertainty. Yay. Oh. It's great. I like this picture. Yes. <laughs> um, and it represents the fact that, of course, the wider the um, the wider the end of the cone, the, the less you can you can predict things, which is why we, we break yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. 
So we're going to go into a couple of areas. One is how to break down work. The other one has, is how to track the work. And I am going to make some assumptions here. Now, these assumptions may or may not be uh, relevant in your world. If your world differs from that, then please tell me about it and we can talk about it. So I'm going to assume that you're going to be tracking your work in some sort of work control system. Uh, and in my world, that's usually either Azure DevOps or JIRA. It can be anything, any sort of ticketing system, which basically says, this is the thing I'm working on. This is the status of it. And it gives you the ability to, to see the status at any point and to track timings through those statuses. Now, traditionally, this used to be um, this used to be post-it notes on a board. And in fact, when I started doing Agile back in 2011, 11, 12, 12, then that's what it literally was. And it was fine. I'm also going to be making the assumption that you're going to be tracking your work accurately. Now, that's not necessarily a safe assumption because one of the reports I'm going to show you in a minute is actually really, really good at proving when the team are rubbish at keeping their tickets up to date. So it, it's a really good sort of audit on um, quality of your ticketing. Um, uh, also, the other one, which this one seems facetious, uh, but it's really important. So the team are honest with you. I had a... Uh, uh, an instance a little while ago where we were, I was mentoring a junior scrum master uh, in a company that I won't, I won't name. And he said, I want to get some help from you because I've got a couple of awkward team members here. And we needed to get the team committed to, to just doing the basic version of the metrics so we could find out where the problems in their delivery were. And there was one team member, and, I, and I'm saying this not in a facetious or a comedic sense whatsoever, but he's the clearest example of a sociopath in the work environment I've ever seen. It was, it was shocking how sociopathic he was. He flat refused to engage in conversation. He flat refused to put his camera on. So I was leading a, a session. I said, can you turn your camera on, please? And he just said, no. And I thought, wow, OK, you genuinely don't care about anybody else. And then we were talking about... Um, uh, monitoring progress and metrics and everything and, and what he said next still shocks me he he said he said i don't know why you're bothering with this and i said what do you mean he said well whatever you put in place whatever systems you put in place you know i'm just going to game it anyway to look good and i thought wow thanks for the honesty but i can't believe you're doing that and it kind of highlighted a point that that a lot of time you know passively or or or, or actively people are going to game the system. So my, one of the assumptions is that people are going to be honest. Uh, and the other one is that you've got the ability to iterate here. And that means you're not just going to start your work and just plow on until you get 90% of the way through and then check your progress. What it means is you're going to keep checking how far you've got. Now, if you're doing software, um, it's going to be things like your daily scrums, or uh, it could be your sprints or, or whatever. If you're doing traditional style projects, you might have weekly check-ins, but you've got to You've got to check in on yourself super frequently so that you've, you've got a chance to course correct. OK, let's think about the solution. So the solution lies in two big parts. One is break your work down into chunks of appropriate sizes. We'll talk about that in a minute. And the other one is use reports to monitor the progress of those chunks through. Let's have a think about work break, uh, breakdown. Um, the five levels that you see here, it's really weird, actually, because when you look at on the, page, on the page, you think, oh, my God, it's five levels. It's really complicated. It's not. These are the names that software teams tend to put on them. And really, all you're doing here is you're taking a whole project. Can you see my pointer, by the way? Is that visible? Can you see my mouse pointer? No. no it doesn't matter. OK, it doesn't matter. If you give so me a laser top, pointer. Oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'll come back. Um, up at the top, you've got um, initiatives. So a classic example of that would be uh, make a mobile app or implement uh, multi-language support in a website or something like that. Very, very broadly speaking, it's going to take a quarter of a year or more to do that. Then those get broken down into epics, which is large lumps of work, which will be multiple sprints or months long. Those get broken down into features, um, which will be at least a sprint usually. If it's a small feature, you might be able to get it out in one sprint. Worth reminding ourselves that a sprint is typically one, two, three or four weeks, never more than four weeks. And then the bits that you, see, that you see a lot of, and probably the most important of these, is the story, the user story. And I'll show you some examples of those in a minute. But the, the important thing about a story is that you've got to be able to complete it in less than one sprint. So if you're doing a really short sprint, that means you've got to be able to get that little lump of work done in, in, in less than five days, typically four. And most often, you know you've got your stories around about the right size when they're sort of less than a week's work. 
And then um, subtasks are the steps that you take to implement a story and subtasks can be tiny. Any questions on that before I, I show you a real world example of that? Okay, so uh, here's a picture I ruthlessly stole from the um, Atlassian website, and it's the visual representation of that. So across the top, you've got the initiative broken down into a bunch of epics, and then stories and tasks underneath, and then subtasks. And it's worth mentioning that the stories are typically represented in the form of, as a insert role, I need thing so that reason so a classic case of this would be in fact you're about to see one of them um, a classic case of this would be um, as a mobile user i need to have biometric authentication so that i can log in easily through my mobile phone or something like that so here's a real example um, from one of my voluntary coding projects that i'm doing i'm building a um hopefully it'll go live in june i'm, I'm building a uh, a system for the UK Armed Forces paragliding community, which allows them to control their participation in paragliding competitions in a, in a safe and, and simple way. Uh, this is an extract from my JIRA. And what you've got there is a list of the epics in there. It's, I've come down two levels from the top, because today we're only going to talk about epics, stories, and, and subtasks. But uh, one you've got here, for example, uh, 109 is, is the home page. And then when I take a step down from there, inside the home page, uh, there's about 23 or something stories in here. And you can see all sorts of things going on. Let me see if I can, uh, uh, let's get rid of that. There we go. Yeah, confirming attendance in a day. Hang on. So where is it? It's on there somewhere. Yeah, so 223, about 10th down. Confirming attendance in a day. So you've got a pilot. And she's logged into the system. She's confirmed that she's in the competition, but she wants to confirm that, that she's going to actually be flying on that day. So she would come in uh, into here. And it says, as a pilot, I need to be able to confirm my attendance so that the dynamic risk assessment can be completed accurately. So it's a really, it's a really simple thing that they're doing through the interface. And then underneath there, you've got a whole bunch of uh, child issues. Down at the bottom in the white section, you've got clarification of what it is in typical Gherkin steps. So that's precondition, uh, action, and then result. And then you can see here, these are basically technical engineering steps. So if I go through this in real world terms, something like, um, yeah, 317, the one at the top, the integration test, that took me about 10 minutes to do. Um, the 319, that took about an hour and a half, two hours to do. And then, uh, 323 took me about two hours to do because that involved doing a bunch of uh, UI work and then making another little view and making it tidy. And then 324 was about half an hour's work as well. So you start to get a feel for the way this is broken down. Yeah. Any questions on that? So the one thing I don't know at this point, and I'm very interested to get your feedback, is when you think about the typical projects that you do, where are your, let's go back a couple, where are your uh, initiatives, where are your epics, where are your stories? Now, stories might be quite obvious, because when I think back to the last presentation we did, what was it, a month ago, um, then he was telling really, really clear examples of, of, of users doing things. And it may well be that your initiative is something like a fixed price project that we've discussed previously as well. But this is something for us to scratch our heads about. We, we use your, as your DevOps uh, for ours. Oh, cool. Yeah. I should have done screenshots from that instead. Any questions or comments on that before we move on to the reports? So just the oh. balsamic wireframe, just sorry, I'm just picking that out. Is, is that embedded in the JIRA, is it? Oh, yes, it is. Yeah, balsamic is awesome. I use it in my JIRA um, for exactly what it seems to, to, to run up um, UI mockups. Um, yeah. It's a plugin in JIRA. I actually don't know to my shame whether or not it exists in DevOps, but I'd be surprised if it doesn't. Um, and also the thing at the bottom there, the white section, is another plugin for Jira called 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 Pave Pro, which is really really good. Um, and and between all these three things here, the, so the description of the classic user story, plus the wireframes, plus the gherkins, <coughs> I like I like to structure my work in this way because it's it's completely unambiguous about what you're building, how it's going to work, what it's going to do, what it's not going to do, and, and why you're doing it as well. 
It doesn't look like it's available for Jadel. It is available for Confluence and Jira, though. So yeah, interesting. Ah, uh, that's frustrating. There must be an equivalent for, for uh, Azure DevOps. Uh, look, yeah, just in case. Yeah, cool. You know, Any more thoughts? A, a heretical idea. If you expanded those out, how much would you have to expand it in terms of making it something a prompt that you could actually feed to a GPT model? You mean each of these tasks? Yes. OK, well, I'll give you a classic case of this. If you take UCAF 317 up at the top, and I do this quite a lot, I will take um, um, an endpoint from an API. So it's, a, it's, it's you know, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a member function in C sharp. It can be anything from three to 30 lines of code. And what I do typically these days is I copy those 30 lines of code, dump it into chat GPT and say, here is a function, write me a unit test that proves that blah, mm. and it goes and 90% and of the time it's all there. It just saves me a lot of time. And interestingly, I did one of these earlier and I sort of forced myself to do it. I thought, right, I want to do this this way. I think I need to do blah, 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 blah. I then asked exactly the same question to chat DPT and the answer that it gave is exactly what I thought. So it was a super useful validation of, of, of what I've been thinking. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a really valid concept. I think you could do that. Yeah, because you could literally make those into a prompt and you could generate yeah. code from that. And you're yeah, still you going can. through and, and you're still going through an engineering process. You're breaking a task right. down into smaller pieces. It's just you're then right. adding automation to it. Yeah, 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 it's really interesting. Any more thoughts or questions on that before we move on to reports? Okay, so let's assume then that you've gone through, and I've deliberately not dug into too much depth of, about how to do work, ground, work breakdown. There's, there's a whole art in itself. But let's assume you've started off with a Hunagra's great big project. You've broken down in, in, into phases or versions or, 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 or whatever, big lumps. You then break it down into tiny little lumps, and hopefully you've got a huge great collection of, of small work items, which are gonna take you less than a week to do. So we've got a handful of reports that we can look at here. Um, and I'm just gonna walk through them step by step. Please jump in if you have questions. Um, and between all of these, these are the most, most typical ones. So the, the classic one that gets used within the, uh, within the Scrum paradigm is, is, is the sprint burn down. On the X axis, you have time, which is typically the duration of the sprint. On the Y axis, you have either story points or if you count in, the, in, the, in our instance here, you have uh, story points, but it, it's just as valid for, for the number of, of tasks left in the sprint. So let's say we start off with, what is it, 11 story points in the sprint. Now the blue line indicates the theoretical burn down of where it should go. You know, the gray section in the middle is your weekend. So this is roughly a two week sprint. Uh, and what should happen is that it should just tick down and roughly follow the line. It never happens like that because they might be quite big lumps. But typical things, I mean, there, there's really one thing that you need to aim at, and that is to get the right hand end of the orange line down to the blue at the end of the sprint so you've completed everything. One of the typical things that you can see in a burn down, which is a, a, a bit of a red flag, is when it flatlines. So if you look at the middle of this one, you've got a huge, great long section of what is it, nearly six days where the orange line is completely flatlined. So if I was the scrum master for this team, I'd be sitting there and going, um, hello, everybody, why are we not moving things to done? What's blocking us? What's going on? Um, other things which are a huge no-no is if the, if the orange line actually goes up, which means that somebody's managed to put something into the work plan that, that, that wasn't there. Uh, but the concept of a burn down is, is super valid. Um, back in the old days when we used to go into offices, do you remember those offices? You know, the ones with smelly people and bad water in them? Um, it used to be the case where if we were all going into the same physical space every day, I would set up a big... <laughs> Uh, screen and put the burn down on it so that everybody walks past can actually see what's going on. Any questions on that one before we move on? Nope. Cool. Um, now, extending the concept of burn downs, the sprint burn down is the smallest level. So you're looking at pretty much the smallest level in there. One of my next favorite ones um, is the uh, release burn down. It gets called version or it gets it gets called release. And this is one of the ones I think, which is going to be most relevant when you're doing the, the, the projects I, I imagine you're all going to do, because none of this really remate, relates to software. It's all about um, how much work you had at the start on the leftmost column. And then you can see as you go through each of the okay. steps, the work changes status and, and, okay. until it's all done. Um, and extending forward from there, 
you get down to the epic level. This one is fantastic. It looks complex, but it's not that bad. But um, the great thing here is that it shows you the complete progress of everything. Uh, all three of these reports, in fact, all, all four of them are, are standard in um, JIRA, I should say, uh, and sure. DevOps has their own equivalents of them. They're very, very similar. And again, it's worth reminding ourselves that these reports are only as good as the information that goes into them. So if your team are blagging it or not moving their tickets when they're supposed to, then it will show in these reports. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go straight on to the really the, the, the god of them all. Um, these reports that we've had here, uh, they're great because you can see what's going on in real time, but they don't particularly have a massive predictive element to them. And the one thing they don't really have is this is this strong empirical ev um, element to them. Now, there's one particular type of chart which shows you this, and it's called the cycle time. JIRA, they tend to call it the control chart. Uh, other people call it um, the, um, the cycle time plot, but it's all the same thing. Um, the absolute gold standard for this is something called Ac Actionable Agile which is a plugin which is available for JIRA and it's also available for Azure DevOps. And I, one of the things I learned just before Christmas, which is really good, is that if you're using um, JIRA, there are two types of projects in JIRA. You've, you've got um, team managed and you've got company managed. If you do a team managed project in JIRA, it, it's great, but you don't get a lot of the reporting because it forces you to bolt into your DI tools, which is, which is quite annoying. But you can overcome that limitation by dropping in the actionable Agile plugin uh, and it kind of it frees you from the limitations and you've got all the reporting you want. And also, if your project's a bit of a mess, both on, on DevOps and on Jira, drop in the actionable Agile plugin and, and you've got it all there. It's absolutely brilliant. So let's take this step by step. It's, this looks like a cross section through a jacuzzi, but don't worry about it. It's not that bad. There's a lot to think about in here. So again, across the bottom, you've got your um, time. And you can usually in, 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 in both of these, you can filter it to whatever you want. So you can look back for the last sprint, the last quarter or, or whatever. So it's just a, a time plot along the, along the bottom there. On the Y axis, you've got how long it took for, for the ticket to, to move um, from, from between the statuses you're thinking about. Typically, it would be from when work started to when it's done, which is the overall cycle time for the piece of work. However, what you can do with this one, and um, this is my personal favorite thing to do, is to start digging into this. So each of the green circles is an individual ticket. Each of the green blobs is a cluster of tickets. And when you go into the real interface, you, you can click on it and see what's going on. A couple of interesting things on here as well. The red uh, line is the overall average for the entire chart. The uh, Blue section, sorry, the, the blue line is your rolling average, and you can see that changes throughout the period of the of the, um, the 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 chart we're looking at here. So, for example, the average cycle time for all of the and we've got what is it, 23 issues that went from 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 start to to finished in here. The average duration for all of them was what was it, five days, ten hours, which is okay-ish. Um, but you can see over here it's going up to sort of 10, 11 days. I mean, you've got some outliers up here, which are taking 20 days to complete. Now, you've also got a couple down here, which are taking zero. Would anybody like to guess why, as a Scrum Master, I would be getting agitated about these? The ones right down at the bottom there? So you've, you've, got, a couple of, you've got a couple of issues that are showing zero cycle time. Why would that bother me as a Scrum Master? Is that a failure of process that it actually got created right. as an issue? Right. Yeah, correct. What typically happens there? So the control chart, you remember a minute ago, I was talking about your, your team blagging you. So the control chart is a really, really great tool for, for, for showing whether or not the team are using their work control tool right or not. Because if they're doing work properly, if they've planned their work properly, there really shouldn't be any work that takes them zero minutes to go from start to finish. And if it's taking less than 10 minutes or something, you know what they've done is they've they've looked at the ticket, they've done all the work on it and completely forgotten to transition the ticket until the last minute. And it goes through all the statuses at the end. So that would be one of those things that we gently discuss in a retro. Um, the blue banding is your um, standard deviation here. So um, you can see that the quality or the variability of this. So uh, a good one down here would be that you've got only about plus or minus two days on, on the duration, whereas over here, 
you've got a really, really wide one. And what that means in practice is if we're over here, if, if the control chart looks uh, so over by January the 19th on the right hand side here, um, if somebody says, right, how long is my piece of work going to take? I would say, right, well, two days plus or minus a couple of days. So it could be quick. You probably have it in three ish days. If we go into the middle of the chart around about November the 17th, I would say, well, it's looking like it's 11 days. It might be as long as 18, 19 days, which is not particularly brilliant. So the control chart is, is super powerful in that respect. Now, hopefully, yes, good. So what you've got here is an example of what happens when you click on one of the items. And this is the point at which the control chart really comes into its own, because I know for a fact that in, in JIRA, it's the only place, this is the only place in the entire system that allows you to see the progress of individual work items down to the minute. Um, so it's, it's really, really valuable from that point of view. So what I've done here to get this picture was I just clicked one of those uh, one of those uh, issues. Um, so a, a question to everybody then: If this week, if this team was running um, a two-week sprint, which I know they were, please tell me one, two, three things that are wrong, and what would I be discussing with the team if I was in a retro? So the team is running a two week sprint. So my first issue is it seems to have been in progress for five weeks out of, out of the Correct. nominal two. Correct. So that will worry yeah. me. Yeah, exactly. That, that would be that would be a no coffee conversation. <laughs> and then the next line down tells you what problem or shall it, sorry, opportunity to fix. So why is why is QA not being picked up even though something has been ready sure. to QA for th for well sure. nearly yeah. four so days? What we would I mean, be asking ourselves is, yeah. So why why is, why is it why has it been sitting there ready for QA for for the thick end of four days? So um, something might be, might have gone wrong there. Perhaps one of our QA bods has gone off sick, or we simply haven't got the right ratio of of QA bods to devs. But the, you know that's that's really poor flow. That is that's really really lumpy flow. Um, and then the QA is taking over a week, which is either something's going wrong or we're not making our tickets small enough. And then the overall cycle time of of, of seven weeks, it's you know it's, it's four sprints. So um, there's probably a number of things going wrong in the team there. So that's the cycle time. The actionable agile adds to this. Um, I would go into detail, but it's really, really, um, really detailed. It's a fantastic plugin. And my favorite part of it is that it does confidence intervals and um, standard deviation in a really, really empirical way. What it's doing is it's turning around to the last work that you did and saying, last time you did work like this, this is how long it took you. And that means that as a team, if somebody turns around to you and says, I've got this piece of work, all the team have to do is look at a previous piece of work, look at the chart, and you'll get them a, a, a very good confidence of, um, of estimate in that. Now, in terms of tracking your projects, this is exactly where the value comes in, because you should be doing this basically every day. And if stuff is slipping, you'll pick it up here before you go a long way off track. Any questions or thoughts on that before we move on? Oh, has anybody seen these before, by the way? Um, let's have a look at this. Yeah, sprint completion. This is quite a good one. And again, in terms of tracking your projects, you can do this right from the very first, I call it sprint or two weeks or whatever in, in your, your project. Uh, the metric you use is entirely up to you. Software teams tend to use story points. I would strongly encourage you to use those if you can. Um, you can use number of items. Just try to avoid using using the mythical person day if you can. Uh, and I'm a huge fan of, of, of tracking the proportion uh, completed over time. So I've got a couple of pictures here, and both of them are real world ones. These are from a team that I was uh, running in uh, Bath uh, back in, I think this was 2018 or something. Uh, and you can see we used to name our sprints after beers. So we had Pete's Winter Brew and Red Beard and Swordfish and all sorts going on here. Um, what we're doing here is we are tracking what we thought we were going to do in each sprint against what we actually thought. And what that means in the real world is when somebody says, how's the project going? Am I going to get what I what you said I was going to get in, in two weeks or three weeks time? This number 
is your confidence. So if somebody had said to me near the end of this, right, what, 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 what's the likelihood that I'm going to get everything that you put into the sprint? I'd say it's about 80% because wobbly bob on, on the right-hand side there is 82.6%. And you can see it varies. Um, it is trending upwards because this is a team that we're getting used to the work and getting used to themselves. Um, so, yeah, it's, you can tell a, a good team are, are able to, to, to hit about 90%. This is quite an interesting one. Um, <laughs> somebody tell me what's going on there. What's the shape of the of, of the data here? I wonder if anybody's going to pick that up. Anybody? I'm having a look. What would you read from this data? I'm, I'm not particularly the trend line, but the orange and blue. Uh. Oh, more no, people philosophy. is more points done per day. Yeah. So there are three. In fact, there are four points in this graph at which our output actually dipped. Can anybody guess why the output of a dev team might have dipped? That's a big deployment. Nope, definitely not that. What can you do to a team that will make the output dip temporarily? Uh, do something else? Uh, yeah, doing the wrong thing. Change priorities? Yeah, no. Demotivate. It's really, the yeah, there is that. <laughs> um, it's really, it's really counterintuitive. If you, you turned around to a planning. planning. Oh, add people. Correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. E each of the points at which our velocity dipped was the points at which we added a new team member. And we worked out over the over time that it was it was a pretty big hit on our productivity. And the key part here is that yes, our productivity was trending upwards throughout, but each time we chucked a new team member in, you get that software counterintuitive thing of of needing to onboard them. So our our short term velocity dipped for for a couple of sprints. It's really interesting. If you tell that to a classical project manager, they're going to get grumpy at you because they make the assumption that you can make things go faster by by throwing more. I hate the word resource at it, and it, it just doesn't work like that. It doesn't scale it, either. I noticed that when you add more no. resources, the resource no. done per person doesn't rise as much. Correct. Correct. Welcome to the wonderful wacky world of software where all, where all the normal rules don't work. <laughs> um, any more questions or thoughts about that? Cool. So putting this in the context of a, of a non-software project, once you've got to the point of creating an iteration, you can call this weeks across the bottom, or you can call it months, you can call it sprints if you want. And once you've got to the point of breaking stuff down so that you can count your items, then you can get this out of here and you can, you can, you can spot dips in productivity really, really fast if you, if you grab the data. Um, when it comes to estimate to actual, it really, really helps to have reference work items, which means finding stuff that you've done previously um, that is similar. Um, now, I don't actually, I don't think I have this graph, but I don't, um, I don't have the picture in front of me, but one of the things we proved while we were there was that there was a direct relationship between the smallness of our work items and our ability to track them and predict them. Now, what that means is that if you want to see as early as possible whether or not the project is on track or off track, you've got to have them down in small lumps, which, you know, it, it's pretty obvious, really. Uh, you know, if you're if you're driving from 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 Bath to Edinburgh, uh, in fact, let me give you a better example. If, if, if you're sailing from uh, Land's End to Florida and you don't bother to check your position until you should be just off the Florida coast, you could be miles off without really knowing it. And it's exactly the same principle. Here's a question. Um, How much of a yeah, sure. management overhead do you accept? Because obviously, if a team is constantly ah. having to report progress, that requires time, yeah, which great could question. be spent great doing question. something. Great question. So, um, each, <laughs> the, facetious, the facetious answer is that the work that goes into reporting it properly is considerably less than the amount that you will lose when it goes horribly wrong. So that's, that's a facetious way to put it. It should be really, really effortless. In other words, 
typical daily scrum is only 15 minutes a day, the proportion of each week or, or the proportion of the team's time that they should spend on planning and reporting to themselves is only 10%. Most teams I've worked with is three to 5%. So it's tiny when you bear in mind that if you never check in on yourself, you can waste 50 to 70% of, of, of all the money and time that goes into the project. So spending three to 5% making sure you're still on course should be nothing. And in terms of getting the information to the system, if you've got a good leader, so if, if, if your scrum master or, or coach or whoever is doing it right, then they should get all the team members to the point where everybody realizes that these tools are incredibly easy to use. You literally just drag a ticket across the board. It takes two seconds to do. And, and you know you've got it right when it doesn't annoy anybody. And, and I get to the point with my teams where if anybody's less than, less than happy about it or if anybody feels that it's graunchy, then something's not quite right and we'll sit down and fix it. It should be super slick. Does that answer your question? Cool. Yes, Any thanks. more questions or thoughts before we move on? Any more questions? Okay, so having talked about all these lovely reports, so we break down our work into small items, we track them as we go, uh, and having all these beautiful reports here, at this point, this is, the, this is my opportunity to say, I don't think that's the best way to do it. Because one of the biggest mistakes I ever see people do is, and, and particularly junior scrum masters do this, they think, oh, great, I've got all these reports, I have to get the reports, I've got to throw them at people, I've got to show them what's going on. And it really turns off the stakeholders. They're not interested in it because they're making the mistake, they're making two mistakes, actually. One is they're not listening to their stakeholders, and two is they're not communicating with them on their own terms. And better than this is to turn around and start with the questions instead. So why do we do reports? It's so that we can, we can, we can engage with the people who care about the pro progress of the project, uh, usually the people who are involved in governance or looking after the customers or paying the bills or, or, or whatever. And it really, really helps if you can start with the questions. And typical questions are going to be things like, when will it be done? How much is it going to cost? How long am I going to have to wait for my work to start? What's the risk of completion? And what's the defect rate? How am I know you're not going to? How am I going to know that you're not going to kill production or open up a security hole? So, and by the way, if anybody has other questions that you you think you might need to answer from stakeholders in the um, in a project, then then shout them out because these were just straight off the top of my head. Bye. Going through these one by one, there are some suggestions that I would make. So, when will it be done? That's your control chart. Your, your cycle time will tell you how long is it going to take for your average size piece of work or even even variants on that between when it starts and, and when it finishes. How much is it going to cost? Well, you just add on to that the cost of the team, um, given that a typical dev team of, of seven-ish people um, down here in the southwest, a typical dev team will be costing you anything between 13 and 18K per sprint. So we're looking at what's that, 20, 26 to 36K per month. It's a lot of money to throw away if, if you know you're not doing the right things. Um, how long am I going to have to wait for, for work to start? Again, that's your control chart. That's aging on items as well. Um, what's the risk? So that is down to your um, estimate to actual ratio and knowing the percentages I gave you there of, of, of typically how much of each iteration has this team been delivering. And what's the defect rate? I haven't actually showed you a picture of that. Um, but in both uh, DevOps and JIRA, you can go in and say, right, for this particular um, time period, how many tickets went to the uh, done state? What proportion of those were bugs? And then with the control chart, you can also, instead of looking at all, all types, so instead of looking at stories and bugs and tasks and all the rest of it, you can go in and you can say, right, if there is a bug, how long has it typically taken us to, to, um, to resolve a bug? And that, that should be nice and short. Can anybody think of any other questions that, that stakeholders typically ask them? When's it finished? It's the only question that some of them will ever ask. I know. When's it going to be done? That's, that's why I put that one on the top. When's it going to be done? And you know, that's tough. It's tough because I don't think they're trying to be hard when they say that. They're very often, they ask those questions. I mean, both because it's natural in human terms to ask that because it's a simplistic question, but they're also asking it. And I say this absolutely not in a pejorative sense but they're asking this from a position of absence of knowledge. They don't understand why they can't have a simple answer to that because our human nature is to ask a simple question and expect a, a, a direct and a simple, usually one answer. And unfortunately, it, it, 
that's not the world in which we work. Any more thoughts on that one? OK, let's go back to those assumptions. And I can't stress enough that with these assumptions, if the way in which you're working and if your, your, your environment is different from this, then this ability to track the work, it's not going to be quite as good. So you might have to scratch your head a wee bit on that one. So this is all great until we get to the paradox. I was a bit grumpy with this. I asked Bing to make me a picture of a, of a, of a project manager uh, who was frustrated at, at her project. And I like this one, but it looks a little bit too much like a cosmetics commercial for, for my taste. Um, so here's a question to everybody, and I'm not being um, deliberately difficult when I say this. Let's assume that you've got a project which is going to run for, I don't know, how long is a typical project? Six months, nine months or something, a year? Give, somebody give me an answer. How long Six months to your... 12 months. Okay, let's say you've got a project which is 12 months long. Let's say you manage to break the work down quite nicely. And it takes you, for argument's sake, two to three months to really get into a cadence. You've got people standing up teams, people coming and going. Somebody goes on maternity leave, somebody travels abroad or whatever. And around about the three month period, the project manager or the scrum master or whoever turns around and says, look, here we are. Uh, I've been tracking all the data. I've gone over it twice. And unfortunately, um, it looks like we're not going anywhere near as fast as we need to. And based on the current predictions, uh, and what I've seen, by the end of the year, we will have completed approximately 60% of what we promised to complete, which I know is a really typical scenario. So the question is, if you were the um, person in charge of the portfolio or, or the PM or, or, or somebody in control of the team, what can you do to get back on track and, and, and complete on time? Take a look at the data and see where they are falling behind. What's uh, the cause of uh, the delay? Correct. And so we saw in our little control chart that we had um, a, a big lag time going to QA. And we saw that we were taking longer to do our tickets than we thought. So let's, let's, that's a really great answer, by the way. So let's say we go in there, we sort our flow out so that we're flowing much faster. But we're still, I mean, it might take you know, a month to sort that flow out. So we're still going to be a third to a quarter of the way through the project. And because we've realized that we have been going slowly, we still we, we know we're still going to have to go very fast because to get ourselves back on track and finish all the work we thought was going to take a, a, a year, we're going to have to both fix the shortfall that we've had and go much, much faster than we ever thought was possible. So how can we do that? Descope some of the elements of the project. Exactly, exactly. Tell me more about that. So how do you know all, which bits to descope? I mean, that's a stakeholder, um, probably a stakeholder uh, decision. Yeah, they're the ones mm. that can decide which are the essentials, which are the mm -hmm. nice to have, which are the, uh, mm -hmm. the you know the frosting on the top. So they yeah, would. Uh, in the so they can do it in terms of functionality desired. Yep. Uh, I think the yep. development team can make suggestions in terms of, well, what about if we don't do scope, but we do this other thing in a slightly different way? Um, yep. And they can uh, uh, trim functionality or, or modify functionality to make it easier yep. to achieve. Yeah, exactly. And what else can we do to make ourselves go much faster? Can we not just review what the requirements are and see whether or not there's now new ways of doing the things that originally came to light? Correct. Yeah. Do things faster or do things lighter or maybe drive a, a, drive even harder at an MVP than you have been before. Um, what else can we do? There's one other thing that... There we go. Throw more people at it. Is that going to work? Probably that, that would be a negative uh, sort of statement. It absolutely will not. And what I'm talking about here is our old friend, the Iron Triangle. I'm hoping mm -hmm. most people are familiar with this. Um, and it basically says that if you if you if you pin one corner of this triangle, you can only modify the other two. And if we think about the way that the classically um, Scrum works, for example, we say, right, we, we pin time by say we, we're going to do a sprint of, for example, two weeks. So we, we, we've changed time. We can only modify scope or, or, or team. I mean, sometimes you'll see cost or resources in there. 
And if we then say, right, for a typical scrum team over the next two weeks, is their capacity going to increase? No, it's not. So for the duration of the sprint, time is fixed, team is, uh, is fixed, the capacity is fixed. So what do we do? We modify the scope and we literally say to ourselves during sprint planning, how much can we get done in the next two weeks? And we're recognizing the fact that that is the iron triangle. If you then extend that out to the entire life of the project, well, if the deadline is fixed, then you can only change the scope or you can only change the output of the team. Now, we know that you can try to increase the output of the team, but it, the, the, the benefit that you're going to get out of it is going to be much, much, much slower than you would want. It's very slow, if at all. So as two of you have already said, really, the only way you can you can get back onto this is with scope. And it, it's quite a weird one because we've got all these wonderful tools at our disposal to 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 track the progress of the project down to really, really small detail and to really see what's going on. And if you look at them frequently enough and if the data are um, are valid enough, then you will know exactly what's going on. And really, the and, and I'm very interested to hear other people's points of view on this. The key thing that I take away from this is that when we're operating with these types of projects, we have really, really limited control. So if you're more than half to two thirds of the way through the project, there's effectively nothing you can do other than, than chop scope. You probably won't be able to slip time, but you, all you can do is chop scope. And what that means, because our, our ability to positively influence or get back on track diminishes down to zero very near the end of the project, all you can do is spot the sp small problems as early as you possibly can. That means that your emphasis must be on getting fantastic monitoring in place right from day one of the project, I and mean, preferably beforehand, so you can so you can work out what's going on. And it's got to be micro as well. It's got to be tiny, tiny little details that you follow, so that you're only making very small course corrections. What do we think of that? Questions? Have I got something wrong there? Am I being controversial? I hope I'm not. Does anybody's experience differ from that? I, I definitely like the uh, the point about having logging and monitoring in place early, so that you can. Mm see what's going on uh it's a huge success factor and i'm surprised they don't specify it in in more of these these um these requests for, for bids and things i mean it's very rare that you'll see somebody say right please please deliver this thing or, and by the way please show us what project tracking tools you're going to have in place by by day one so that you know that it it, it stays on track yeah any more thoughts on that I think oh. just just one question for you, Tim. Based upon mm. what what you've just been going over, the micro mm. sort of elements of it. I suppose if you reverse that, if you if you used to look at the larger something that's larger, then the actual impact that that has on change mm. is almost immeasurable at that point because you don't know at that level what is actually going to be affected by that change <laughs> or by that update that's coming in. Where if you can no, you take that high level and break it down mm. into smaller components, like you're saying, then actually the modification at the micro level is a lot less um, from a, I guess, cost stroke time perspective. But actually, if you've got multiple minor things that are going on at the same time, different people, that all then feeds into the larger level yeah. scale of things. And so having yeah. it in that way is kind of more sensible way of doing things rather than from a stakeholder's perspective, coming saying, oh, we've seen something new and we want to change this. Exactly. I, I completely agree. And you're, you're reinforcing one, one of my key points here is that the your ability to keep your projects on track and know what's going on is directly proportional to the effort that you've put into breaking them down into, into small items. Um, and it's a standard thing in, in, in Scrum teams as, as well. The smaller your items are, um, the better your visibility is, the better your ability to to change things when they go off track. Any more thoughts on this? I'm, I'm keen to learn from other people's experience of, of their real world projects. So that's most of the content. Uh, Dylan and I had an interesting conversation earlier where um, he demonstrated to me very effectively the art of um, cognitive bias and, and, and um, what was it we called it? Optimism bias, where he said, how long is your presentation going to be? And I said, oh, it's about um, 
28 slides, I'll get through it in about 20 minutes. And I don't think I've done that at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really interesting because he predicted about an hour and I've been talking for about, I think, 50 minutes now. So, yeah, he was, he was Bob on. Any more thoughts? Any more questions? And by the way, it's me flying. I've got one for you, Tim. Um, Go for it. Really, it's just from personal experience that I've encountered a lot and just to get your thoughts on it. So uh -huh. with, with sprints, usually from experience perspective, let's say a sprint is two weeks long. Then by default, it almost feels like at the end of that two weeks, the next sprint starts Correct. almost directly. There's no break point in between. But the for gap my, between the two should be zero seconds, exactly zero seconds. Yeah, but my argument on that is, where do you fit a retrospective in between the sprints oh, very good. to very understand good. the question? OK, guys, this is sprint one. Have we done everything we've got to do? No, yep. these yep. things have got to be moved over to sprint two, et cetera. And who's going to tell the people working in sprint two what they've got to do if you haven't fit a if retrospective you, in there? Yeah, if you bear with me a moment, I think I might have a picture that tells you exactly the answer to that. Bear with Bear with, bear with, bear with. And the reason I ask it for is simply because people say, well, your retrospective should be part of your two week sprint. But if that's the case, then you shouldn't be forecasting two weeks worth of development work. Yeah, very good. Very good. Yeah. So I don't actually have the picture to hand, but I, I, when I'm, during my estimation thing, uh, I put up a picture of Outlook over a two week period and you can see the end of day sprint in there. And a, a typical end of day sprint, uh, sorry, end of sprint day when it's done right is you'll either do your stand up or not. It's, it's not you basically don't need a, a stand up in the morning. Then you'll go um, straight into sprint planning very early in the day. So everybody's caffeinated and, and awake. If you're doing it right and if you're doing a two week sprint, you can get through that in half an hour. If you're doing it nicely, straight off the back of that coffee break, um, sprint review, quarter of an hour with the stakeholders. Hopefully that will finish just before lunch or something. And then immediately after lunch, um, retro with the team for an hour, a good solid hour, maybe more if you need it. And then crack on to the afternoon of, 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 of um, end of sprint day. You can start picking up tickets to the next sprint. Now, what I often like to do as a scrum master, it actually doesn't matter. But we would work out what our nominal output for a particular day would be. And then when it went to telling the stakeholders about that, I would turn around to them and say, right, on a typical day, you'll get this, well, like 2.7 story points per person per day. I'm only going to plan nine and a half days productivity in a 10 day sprint. And that half a day is to allow for the fact that, that, that the, the sprint ceremonies, the end of sprint ceremonies are not going to be productive time from the point of view of writing code and, and progressing value through to done. I mean, it, it is extremely critical time that we do those things at the end of the sprint. But what's more important is that we have the, the team agreeing on when we're going to do those things and how we're going to do them. And we try to fix the cadence of that as much as we can. And we then allow the team to inspect themselves at the end of each iteration, make any changes they want, moderated by the wise words of an agile coach or a scrum master. So that, I mean, I've, I've heard this a few times when a team knee jerks or tries to knee jerk away from, um, away from um, scrum onto Kanban. And, and very, very often they don't understand the rights and responsibilities of Kanban. So I will intervene and, and gently take them through a small series of workshops so that they, they can then make an informed decision. It's very natural for people to say, I hate ceremonies, I want to do Canada. But there's a lot, a lot more to it than that. But yeah, I, I think it's a really valid point that you're making. I think, I think uh, just sort of seeing this in action is that the mm -hmm. nine and a half day approach, it sounds good, but in the reality of it, people still end up pushing to get something done by the end of the 10th day, not finishing after nine and a half days. And so in a way, your retrospective side, uh, side of things within that last half a day call it the friday afternoon if you want to the last friday afternoon of your sprint mm. that's then swallowed up by people trying to rush to get something due for that sprint right so that, then has the knock-on be... effect of everything else right so that would be um may i have your permission to say something slightly harsh yeah you got it yeah so if you have a team 
where the retrospectors so two things are happening that you've just described there one is that that people are struggling to finish the sprint and two is that the retrospectives are being allowed to slip in favor of that work the the scrum master has failed in two respects there because it's the scrum master plus the team's responsibility to make sure that whatever happens come hell and high water all of the standard sprint ceremonies will happen on time it's one of the basic rules of, of Scrum. None of these timings will ever change. And the other one is, if they're doing that fumbling to the last minute at the end, then that's an opportunity for the Scrum Master to turn, to turn around to, uh, in the retro and say, right, everybody, you all looked really uncomfortable when we went into the sprint review because the work wasn't quite ready. Let's have a think about that and let's see how, if we can make ourselves feel better about this because it shows that they they need a wee bit of fine-tuning there on their capacity because it should be they sail gracefully into the into the sprint review and they've had time to 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 check all the data's right and practice the demos and everything slick this is the thing about about agile and scrum when it's done properly it should be calm collected professional and graceful and if it's not then the scrum master's not doing their job properly yeah well it wasn't harsh trust me it wasn't what you said it's just (laughs) that i've experienced that many many times over 30 years where people just almost like it gets forgotten about and like you say it has to be held within that remit of that time frame otherwise yeah, just, you just open yourself up for just, problems later on it, it, it's just professionalism and discipline i'm being harsh there but it, there are some basic there are some there are some fundamentals to doing this work properly and you know speaking as a software engineer as well i don't push to production without testing stuff and i put that in exactly the same category as not moving sprint ceremonies it's just basic professional standards. Okay, cool. Uh, what were you, what were we saying, as I mentioned, Jira and Luke, you think Jira and Oh, that's nice, right. Any more thoughts, any more questions? Have I said anything that anybody violently disagrees with or even, even pacifistically disagrees with? So, I mean, let me, if I may summarize um, what we're going to there. If you want to keep a good grip on your report, uh, on your your projects, do three things. Break it down to the smallest possible bits. And you don't have to break the whole thing down into bits. So break the first bit down into bits and then keep breaking it down as you go. Track it, track it early and track it at the smallest level of, of precision that you possibly can, right down to the details. And keep on top of it and be prepared to course correct very, very early and frequently as well. Those, those are the big messages here. Questions? Why have I run out of water so quickly? What is the, um, the, the smallest sized effort you have? So like 15 minutes, half an hour, one hour, what would you do? suggest so if i think about the teams in which i've worked and um dev teams that i've worked for uh, i'll slightly rephrase your question if i may so so the modal size the size that i see most common from teams is around about one to two days long the smallest one i would ever expect to see would be a 10 minute job but those are relatively infrequent does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Yes, thanks. And, and and when you're down to the ten minute job, it would be your sort of small subtask on a on a on a user story level. Uh, but you know you've got it right when most of the things. If you look at the sprint board immediately after sprint planning, or if you look at the top end of the backlog in, in a Kanban team, if more than half to two thirds of the things in there are around about a day's work then you've got it right it's super rough but i mean the other classic would be if you go and look at there or the sprint is full of tickets that are going to take six days or the top end of your backlog is full of tickets that are going to take uh, you know more than twice your recent cycle time then yeah you ain't broken it down small enough does that answer your question yes it does cool any more I'm disappointed. I was expecting to be really controversial and for people to tell me that my world of rarefied software engineering bears no relevance at all to your real project. I, I have one more question, actually. Um, yeah, correct. Have, have you worked outside of uh, software uh, in, in a more predominantly manufacturing and waterfall environment and any recommendations in that space? 
Um, have I worked in that way? Yes, I sort of have. Um, when I first moved to Iceland, I was doing a combination of hardware and software engineering. Um, I didn't know anything about Agile back then. Um, can you describe the environment that you've got in mind there? So, um, it's, it's um, manufacturing, um, so right. creating products. It's got software, it's got hardware. Um, yeah, yeah. But it's a predominantly waterfall environment who is now moving on to an agile uh, based uh, planning and uh, you know, trying to move it forward in that direction. Uh, a lot of challenges. Okay. Um, and, and, and may I ask, why is it waterfall at the moment and why are they hoping to move to agile? Uh, so I'll, I've just joined the company, so <laughs> I don't oh, okay. know why okay. they made the decision and the, the approach. Yeah. Um, the, I'm, a, I'm a scrum master myself, but the approach they're taking um i'm not leading leading the agile transformation um mm -hmm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm leading another project uh, because of my right. experience in space before but yeah. um, it, I'm, I'm having conflicting views but i'm just wanted to gear from your perspective you know how would you go about uh in in this kind of environment and and transformation uh, into an agile space yeah yeah that sounds really interesting um are you able to say what the organization is it's okay if not um, it's a um, it's a automotive manufacturing. Oh, okay, cool, cool. So, <laughs> interestingly, the first thing I would recommend that you do is read a book called The Phoenix Project. <laughs> Have you read it? <laughs> no, I'm familiar with it. I haven't read it yet. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's about a it's a, it, it, it's about a company that that that, that makes hard, makes uh, automotive components and software, um, and they're struggling to get from waterfall to agile. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Um, and, and, and it's about all of that, and it's about the importance of DevOps. Um, the first, I mean, this is a huge subject, and, I, and I'd be very happy to discuss it with you further offline if you want. Um, probably the single biggest factor in there can be encapsulated in one word, and that one word is predictability. Uh, it's all about... So, so agile methods exist because waterfall fails typically for software projects because waterfall works when you've got extremely high levels of predictability over long time scales. And when I say long, I mean more than two to three months. And that almost always doesn't exist in software. So in, 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 in place of that, what you do is you put agile in there, you bring all the boundaries down much, much shorter, and we worked a very, very narrow window of predictability. Now, the way that it's going to work in your world is, is, is by establishing what are your actual boundaries of predictability. For some teams, that's a month. For some teams, that's two to three months. For some teams, that's three days. And then once you've got that limit of predictability and you can prove to it, you can then start working within it. The next thing that goes alongside it is the people outside of the team, because predictability is only relevant when you put it within the context of the people for whom predictability matters. And that's your stakeholder community, because they're going to be asking all those questions that I asked. So the two things have to go side by side. And, and somebody will have said, well, probably, hopefully somebody will have said, uh, waterfall isn't giving me the predictability. It's not giving me the visibility or, or, or the deliverables that I need. It's not delivering properly. I've heard there's this thing called agile that can help. That it rarely happens like that. In my experience, usually somebody says something like, "My mate down at the golf club said that agile is brilliant. We should do it. So we're going to go and press the agile button." And it kind of doesn't work like that. But I would encourage you to identify your stakeholders. Identify their needs in terms of visibility and predictability, and then work backwards from that point. If you're dealing with manufacturing in particular, I would strongly suggest that you, you consider a Kanban model. Because Kanban was designed, um, or Kanban in software was designed off the back of the Toyota manufacturing process. And I believe the word Kanban is Japanese for card or something. Does that help? Yes, it does. I think because I believe that, um, like you said, if somebody's decided down the, the local pub that they want to move towards agile, um, and and it's a fairly young team, inexperienced in this space, although technically gifted, um, they're not familiar with the the agile processes, and it's mm. uh, it's mm. be slightly long, long and hard um, moving forward. 
Yeah, well, you know, please reach out to me after this and we'll have a chat about it. I'm I'm very happy to to um to uh, give you a shoulder to cry on because <laughs> it sounds like you might need it. I, I've been in that situation many times myself, and it's it, it's very hard work from the point of view of a scrum master. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, Takami. I hope I'm not pronouncing that wrong. Am I pronouncing that wrong? I, I apologize. I yes, Kanban um, Toyota Production System. Nice. Any more questions or thoughts, please? What 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 do you think is after Scrum? Do we think there's a a next evolution of agile projects? So there, hey, maybe it's AI. Maybe AI will be the thing, and it'll be good. Good question, well presented. So I discuss this a lot with my my fellow agile coaches, and. The answer that we get back very often has, it's a kind of amorphous sort of cloud of, of answer, but the yeah. answer very often has got things in it like um, a very, very effective DevOps pipeline so that, so that solutions are delivered extremely fast to the people that matter and so that feedback is garnered extremely fast, you know, by which you can basically say, if it, if it takes more than, shall we say, two days from um, being told about something until getting the feedback from the people, yeah. then it's way too slow. And if you're not deploying to production at least 10, if not 100 times a day, then, then something's wrong. Um, and that's also coupled with two other really, really key things, or three, I would suggest. One is it's usually a Kanban model. It's usually very, yeah. very heavily yeah. based on flow because flow is everything here and, and minimizing time through the flow states. Uh, and then autonomy. The teams absolutely must be autonomous, but yeah. they can be completely autonomous in their ways of working. But what they cannot be autonomous in is which value is delivered to the users. And that implies that the teams really shouldn't have the full control over the top end of the backlog and the full control over which strips of value are going to be delivered to the team at any one time. And that means the final really, really important piece of the puzzle is you've got to have an incredibly powerful, fully autonomous, fully respected, fully enabled product owner. And she's got to have the power and, and the ability to build a beautiful backlog and to be able to turn to the top end of the backlog at any hour on any given day and say, look, that's what we're going to do. Uh, and when you put all those things together, then you get a really high performing environment. And, you know, w without sounding facetious, what really the, the icing on the cake is when you can turn to all those people in the team and say to them, how long have you been there? And they've all been there at least a year, if not two years, because they're all happy and they're not looking to leave. And that persistence is, is, is kind of the secret sauce that a lot of people look for. Does that answer your question anyway? Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, so you see, sort of, what we sort of, you know, you kind of, you probably start off with more of a Scrum-based approach as you start a, maybe a new product, and then yeah, it's easier the point, than Kanban. Yeah, and then and then you get to the point where you're in that flow. You've you've got something working beautifully, mm. and then you're iterating, mm. making small incremental changes, and switching mm. to a Kanban where you might have support issues coming in and things which need to be tweaked and changed, Correct. but also then Correct. features in as well, which so you can kind of Correct. switch between the two. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Although paradoxically, one, and I've done this, one of the things that Kanban is great at is dealing with the very, very early stages of a product. Um, so if you're building something that, that you don't know how to build yet, and a lot of your work is yeah, around okay. answering questions yeah. and research, Kanban's great for that because... Mm. If, yeah. if, if your work revolves around a lot of questions, it's like, you know, can I do that? Is that going to work? Is that going to integrate with that? Is the performance going to be okay for that? Are those deployments going to work right or whatever? Or even with design as well. You know, if you're iterating through lots and lots of user experience designs very fast and you don't know which one's going to work, uh, that means you don't have a boundary of predictability. You can't say in three weeks' time we will have done that because you just don't know if it's going to work or not until you try it. So Kanban really suits that well. And, and the key bit there is that the team, the team have to be really, really comfortable with what doing Kanban feels like, rights and responsibilities. They have to be comfortable with what doing Scrum 
feels like, we write some responsibilities, and when to blend them together. You know, I've done Scrum Ban as well, which has been nice. You know, Scrum plus work in progress limits is lovely. Um, and then the team has to feel empowered and safe to chop and change whenever they want. And that's, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to get teams to that point. And of course, on top of that, you need a really great Scrum Master slash Agile coach as well. Yeah. So there's a current thing about OKRs that that seems to yep. be objective key result. That seems to be something mm. that's emerged recently. I'm just wondering if that will eventually um, feed into the agile world and produce another system. Because you already it's already had Google love OKRs. Um, yeah. I'm going to be opinionated and say I. OK, I'm going to be super opinionated now and say, right. Any set of metrics that have got an acronym can can just walk out the door as far as I'm concerned, because it's it, 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 it's it's cargo cult and it's it's basically marketing and it's not adaptive enough. You know, like Dora is, is, is great, but it only works for one particular uh, paradigm. The Dora metrics work really well for a mature DevOps model, but they don't help you get teams to a mature place. OK, ours are great. But then you're back to the old IBM advert. You know, the most powerful computer you have is the one that everybody use, uses. And you can try and put Dora in place, but if everybody hates it, then you might as well not bother. If you can try to put OKR, OKRs in place. And it's not about the reporting. It's not the power of the reporting. The power lies in the organization adopting whatever you want. This is why, you know, you can go and rubber stamp anything and try and shout at the organization. It's not going to work. You're just going to get people's backs up. What really, really matters instead is to go out, reach out to the people, listen to them hard, make sure you've understood everything, play back what they want. And then perhaps if, if there's stuff they don't know about, gently persuade them that there's this brilliant thing that might help them and you can help give it to them. So it's got to be collaborative as opposed to, um, you know, sort of imperative like that. OK, that's a great. I'm sure if the whole organization uses them properly. Hmm. Hearts and minds, hearts and minds. It's like love or respect, you know. Can't buy it. You got to plant it and hope it grows. Speaking from a man who's failed in that so many times, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> You're on mute, Bill. <laughs> I was going to say I should have. I, it was correct. I, I shut myself up then. <laughs> Deliberate mute. <laughs> Oh, by the way, your challenge, everybody, is if you do read the Phoenix Project, come back and tell me which of the characters in the Phoenix Project I am. <laughs> Very good. Any more thoughts or questions? Thanks, so. Cool. You can probably stop recording if you want, Simon. Okay. So that Thanks, I can Tim. start telling rude jokes. I'll, I'll do that.